Hi guys, Dr. Dillard here, it's GIGU. It's Thursday, it's week eight, it's the spring of 2021, off we go. Where have we been? Well, it's been a while, we've been about a week since we talked about uh, gastrointestinal patho pathology. So last time we talked about intestinal obstruction, also known as small bowel obstruction. There are generally two types of small bowel obstruction, mechanical and functional. We said functional occurs when peristalsis stops working. There's no mechanical problem. Everything has the potential to work, but it just stops. It's usually some problem with the enteric nervous system. Mechanical obstruction means the enteric, uh, the enteric nervous system is fine and peristalsis is fine, but there's a physical blockage of the tube. Uh, we call that a beaver dam. So it's hard to push fecal material through the tube if there's a beaver dam, right, if there's a blockage. The number one cause of a beaver dam is, out, is actually something called an adhesion, which strangles the intestine from the outside. That's the number one cause in adults. Right, then we looked at this, this example here of the intestine. The small bowel was blocked right here, and no fecal material could get through, so it backed up fecal material here. And most of this is gas. The bacteria are having a party. Bacteria aren't designed to be in your gut forever, uh, but they, they move through with the fecal material. But if they get stopped and they get stuck, and they don't move through. They have a party, and they breed and multiply and release all sorts of gas, and your belly swells up. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's a classic mechanical obstruction. And it can be dangerous. We see some purple here. Some inflammation of the wall has started. And this can get to the point, not only is it incredibly painful, but it can get to the point where it ruptures and spills all this inflammatory juice and bugs and pus into the abdominal cavity and into the peritoneal cavity. And that can lead to septicemia and kill you real fast. Let's not forget kids. The number one type of obstruction in kids, small bowel obstruction, is something called the intussusception. We talked about, especially down here at the ileocecal region, how the intestine can start to ferret its way into the large intestine, like this has happened here. Um, and you can imagine fecal material is going to have a real t hard time. You know, here's, here's a bunch of fecal material. It can't get through that little tiny hole. And so you get yourself a beaver dam, just like that last picture we saw. Got it? All right, so now let's get to some new stuff. In fact, this is a good time to talk about adhesions which again are the number one cause of obstruction in adults. 75% uh, of the time, if someone gets small bowel, a small bowel obstruction, someone over the age of 18, it's because of adhesions. And again, children, culprit was intussusception. What are adhesions? They are bands of collagen, basically of fibrous tissue, that spider web through the peritoneal cavity and can entangle the free moving intestines and cause it to tie up in a knot basically and that causes a beaver dam because of that. All right, here's surgical a surgical small bowel blockage in someone and they had a big kind of a gnarly looking adhesion right there that he's clamped off and he's showing everybody that shouldn't be there. All right, it tangled up the intestines. Um, where are adhesions found? They're between adjacent tes uh, between adjacent intestines. They can grow. They can grow between the intestine and the inside of the abdominal wall, uh, or they can grow between intestines in the surgical scar of, let's say, an appendectomy. Right here in this picture, we see we have some intestinal adhesions that have basically tied and twisted this piece of intestine, and especially right here, it's being strangled. So the fecal material is backing up, and it can eventually pop a hole in this and leak pus into the abdominal cavity, into the into the peritoneal cavity. And I mean, you could die from that. They could get peritonitis. You will get peritonitis from that if something isn't done. There's another uh, during intraoperative picture, and you can see a inter intestinal adhesion right here pretty strong uh, which is called strang caused a strangular or caused a 
an obstruction right here. Look how skinny this is compared to how blown up this is. That's because the backup, the beaver dam, is all backing up into here. All right, uh, what's the sequelae of an adhesion? Or the adhesion, what's the result of getting an adhesion? Uh, well, sometimes it's not a, f the adhesion itself isn't, it doesn't always cause a strangulation. In fact, most of the time it's completely asymptomatic. Uh, but if it does call the, cause a strangulation, it, if it does snarl up or, or entangle the intestines to the point you can't move fecal material through, then you got yourself, uh, you, then you're in trouble, right? You'll, uh, the, it just as, as I've just said, the intestinal wall can become so well in to the point it cuts off the circulation in the intestinal wall and the tissue becomes ischemic and ruptures. And about 3% of all adhesions ultimately end up to a kind of a clean-out surgery. Where do they come from? Uh, usually from a peritoneal injury. Uh, so, and what can injure the peritoneum or the parietal peritoneum? mainly. A uh, surgical procedure, they have to cut through it, right? Well, the peritoneum has to heal. And it heals via the scar tissue process. And some people develop scars, lots of scar tissue, and some people don't. Um, so surgical procedures, if you get poked with a knife or you're in a sword fight or get shot in the belly or shrapnel in the belly, any injury to the peritoneal cavity is big trouble. Not only for the risk of infection, but um, it's got a decent chance of leaving scar tissue, which can later tangle up the intestine. There are congenital adhesions, and I took this out because we just don't have enough time in this class. Um, so I took out the Vitalin duct. I do have YouTube videos on this. It's a good embryological uh, phenomenon that you should know about. I encourage you to go Google Dr. Gillard persistent Vitalin duct, and it should pop up. Um, but yeah, so there are adhesions uh, basically that you're born with, and one of these is called a persistent vital induct. That's all I'll say about that. Uh, what? Uh, so I said surgery is a very common cause. What about surgery? Uh, is is the culprit here? What factors from surgery uh, causes it? Well, the physical damage you're cutting through the peritoneum, and you have to stitch it up. Uh, and therefore, that has to heal with scar tissue. And again, some people scar like crazy. They scar so much, the scars will connect adjacent intestines together. Um, if you're, let's say, you've had a hernia and you had to cut out a piece of small bowel, some of the small bowel material is going to leak. Some of the inflammatory cells are going to leak into the peritoneal cavity, and that stimulates a cleanup process and inflammation, which can lead to adhesions. Uh, there's some research that shows the the powder that the surgeons use to put on their hands and then they put their gloves on. Some of that can get in the abdominal cavity and cause and cause adhesion. Surgical gauze particles from gauze, the sutures, overheating the intestines with a lamp for vision, uh, and even irrigation fluid. Some people seem to be almost allergic to it. And then there's probably a genetic propensity to adhesions as well. And specifically, there's some research that shows some people have a, uh, a depressed fibrolytic response because uh, adhesions are normally cleaned up. Um, and some people may have a defective mechanism to that regard. What about the timing? When are they going to come? Usually they come within one year after the surgery. Um, it's not always the case. They could develop years later. My wife actually had trouble with these probably 10, 15 years after uh, an abdominal surgery. All right, so that's enough about that. We're starting a new category now, another board favorite. I love this topic, hernia, right? Specifically, abdominal wall hernias. Uh, so we have three types of of real abdominal wall hernias. They're kind of general abdominal wall hernias. Uh, there are umbilical hernias. There are groin hernias. Groin, these are all abdominal wall hernias. Groin hernias have su two subcategories called inguinal hernias and femoral hernias. Inguinal hernias have two subcategories themselves called direct inguinal hernias and indirect inguinal hernias. 
And most authors say these are all forms of abdominal wall hernias, even femoral hernias. Right, and here's some you should know. This, this slide is always, you have to memorize these. I always, even if I'm not going to talk specifically about these, you need to know what these abdominal wall hernias are. There's an epigastric hernia, which occurs uh, in the linea alba, right underneath the, the, the xiphoid process. There's an umbilical hernia, pretty much where we, we learn to palpate the abdominal aorta. There's an umbilical hernia, which occurs in the umbilicus. Here's one from an incision, uh, an appendectomy, ended up herniating here. Uh, Ispigelian hernia occurs in the right at the edge of rectus abdominis. So the linea semilunaris is a line of tissue that that kind of in, is at the lateralmost part of the rectus abdominis. We have an inguinal hernia. Uh, there's a direct and an indirect we'll talk about. Then there's a femoral hernia. So you need to know this stuff. I think I got all the ones I wanted to make. So make a note card. Name me the, uh, the what is it, six of them? Name me the six abdominal wall hernias. Those of you who are having trouble with this class, note card. Name me the six abdominal wall hernias. And, and give me a short blurb about where they are. All right, let's talk about small bowel hernias in general before we get into the more specifics. So there's a nice bigelian hernia, right? And linea semilunaris, there's a nice picture of one. But a small bowel hernia. So what is causing this bump is the question. What are all these bumps? Most of the time, they're, they're intestine that have, that have poked through a hole in the abdominal musculature. And it's herniating out. Greater omentum is often in some of these upper ones. Greater omentum usually isn't down in the low ones, but it could be as well. All right, so small bowel herniates through a defect or a weakness in the anterior abdominal wall or inguinal region. Yeah, well, look, so they don't always herniate through the abdominal wall. They can herniate through the, uh, through the peritoneum, the retroperitoneum, uh, and get into the retroperitoneal space uh, or into the lesser sac. We'll look at that. But usually it's abdominal wall. Not all, though. They count small bowel hernia. that counts for about 10% of mechanical small bowel obstructions. Counts for about 30% of small bowel surgeries. So it's a very common procedure. Um, it has a high tendency to incarcerate. Incarceration is really dangerous. That could lead to a perforation. Uh, and the spillage of pus and inflammatory juice into the peritoneal cavity, and that can get right into the bloodstream. And you can die quickly of peritonitis from that. Um, so yeah, what does incarcerated mean? That means just what I said, the, the small bowel can get pinched so tight as it goes through the defect in the abdominal wall that it can't get blood out of the tissue. The veins get squished, and you can't. Arteries can pump blood into the string, the, the herniated tissue, but you can't get blood out. Uh, and therefore, the hernia, the herniated intestine gets bigger and bigger and bigger to the point it finally pinches off the artery. Now you don't have any blood getting to the herniated tissue and it starts to die, become ischemic. The bacteria trapped in there run wild and eat a hole right through it and then all that pus and stuff pours out. Uh, some hernia terminology, orifice, so that's the defect or the hole in the abdominal wall has a name, it's called the orifice. The stuff that's bulging out of the orifice has a name, it's called the hernia sac. Hernia sac. All right, there's a nice picture of the abdominal wall, there's the skin, um, there's the defect right here or the orifice, we'll say maybe that's the umbilical plate. You. You have a defect in the umbilical plate and your intestines went right out your belly button. We'll say that's an umbilical hernia. Could be a spigelian hernia. Could be a subxiphoid hernia or epigastric hernia. Could be anyone. Uh, but these are just the parts of it. So that's the orifice. The stuff on the outside is called the hernia sac. Um, and yeah, that's the story. We'll go over those layers here in a second. Actually, that second is here. So I, you, you know I love my anatomy, so I could throw this question on here. 
um, what is the order uh, of or the uh, going from superficial to deep the last two layers of the abdominal wall are blank blank and blank so you should know this the most superficial top that you can touch you can rub your belly you can rub the epidermis then going deep that's the dermis going deeper that's the subcutaneous tissue which has got all kinds of aka's superficial fascia hypodermis subcutis the skin for chiropractors purposes is epidermis and dermis um, some authors include the next layer the third layer down subcutaneous tissue some authors don't the chiropractic board book, books don't what's the fourth layer down that's usually muscle or the aponeurosis of muscle like the rectus abdominis or if you go out more laterally external oblique that should be oblique not bleed uh, internal oblique transversus abdominis we're going deeper and deeper on each one of those uh, the next layer down uh, are the three deep layers of fascia we have transversalis fascia deeper to that is uh, extraperitoneal fascia aka preperitoneal fat uh, and then finally parietal peritoneum and deeper than that we hit the greater omentum usually it depends on the location but usually greater omentum it's anterior abdominal wall we're talking about then you're going to hit the intestine but the out the intestine is covered with visceral peritoneum and then the intestinal wall itself so make sure you know that stuff right i'm not going to go through this but um yeah this we just talked about all these different layers external blake internal blake transversus abdominus is the third transversalis fascia is right here um yeah there's the belly button and I'm not going to go over this either. You should know this for boards, though. Remember, it's kind of weird. The rectus abdominis has a rectus sheath that is interesting. Here's the external oblique, intra oblique, transversus abdominis. The external oblique, th these are double, double layered ligaments. You know, it's only showing one ligament here, or double layered fascia. Um, so this top layer completely goes around the top part or the anterior part of the rectus abdominis the internal oblique is interesting it splits its outer leaf goes anterior its inner leaf goes behind to create the posterior part of the rectus sheath then the transversus abdominis both its leaves or its layers go posterior so could I ask that you never know what I'll ask and that's once you get below the belly button that's not true all of the leaves go all of the leaves go to the front. Another way to subdivide hernias, we could classify them as external hernias or internal hernias. So external is the ones that we can see. Those The hernia sac is outside the abdominal wall and we can see it. And these are by far, by far the most common, usually in the anterior abdominal wall or the inguinal region is where these are seen and they can and contain well they can all contain intestine maybe some greater momentum as well then we have the internal hernias uh, so those occur inside we can't see these uh, for example uh, w one type of hernia can go through the foramen of Winslow into the lesser sac and cause trouble another one can go into the retroperitoneal space uh, and get pinched and these can incarcerate as well remember the anatomy of this region so here's the interperitoneal space um, and then this is the peritoneum peritoneum tomatoes tomatoes I always learned a peritoneum and most people in this country call it peritoneum or peritoneal peritoneal space it just doesn't have a good ring to it peritoneal space is easier to say but here it is so this is all parietal peritoneum right right and that's really really important because that these are made of serous cells and it secretes a little bit of fluid that makes the intestines slippery but outside of this this is retro peritoneal space here um, all this area back here and there's several layers of it we're not going to get into that but yeah so you can get a hernia back in that direction 
like in this little cartoon. Uh, so here's the here's the intestine, and you can see a hole has been punctured right in the posterior part of the peritoneum, and part of the intestine, but not all the intestine, has been sucked out here, and it's all red and inflamed. Right. That's actually got a name when part of the intestine goes through the through the defect and forms the hernia sac, but part of the intestine is not outside of the orifice. It's called a Richter's hernia. Richter's hernia. You should know that word. Make a note card of that. That's an easy note card. Right? We can also have a lesser sac hernia. Um, so intestine, remember the lesser sac? If you remember gross two anatomy? Uh, so lesser sac lives behind the lesser omentum. Here's an A to P view of the stomach. Here is the uh, hepatoduodenal ligament here. And here's the hepatogastric ligament. These two together make up the lesser omentum. There's a little tunnel right here where you can stick your fingers in if you need to. In fact, surgeons have to stick their fingers in here and grab the kind of the neck of the gallbladder to tie off the cystic artery when they're getting ready to cut this thing. This is called the foramen of Winslow. If you can get your fingers in there, intestines can get up in there. And you can get yourself a hernia like this. Right? That's called an internal hernia. Internal hernia. More terminology. Uh, what does reducible mean? Reducible means that the hernia can be pushed back into the abdominal cavity. These are not as dangerous. Uh, if you go into the ER and you have this bump sticking out and you're worried about it, if they can push it back in, they can reduce the size of it. It's reducible. It's not as, as worrisome. you got time to have surgery to close it. Uh, if it's incarcerated, you can't push it back in and it hurts. Uh, that means that it's the intestinal wall has swollen up because of that. The venous return has been cut. And I already just talked about how that works. And it's become an ischemic. Incarcerated her hernias typically turn into strangulated hernias. Okay, and yeah, I just went through everything I already talked about, how it can become ischemic really quickly. Uh, Richter's hernia, as we said already, here's, I made it more official. So that's when part of the, the, the bowel herniates out through the abdominal wall. Uh, the other half is still in. Some fecal material still may be moving through there. Uh, but part of the intestine is now out through the defect. It can become strangulated and you can get a perforation. and It can definitely cause a beaver dam as it swells. So here's the Richter's hernia. So um, this can become ischemic and hurt really, really bad and become abscessed and the the pus can drip back into to the peritoneal cavity if this thing ruptures. Remember, it's going to have skin over the top of it, right? So it's not going to rupture and you're not going to have pus. Usually, you're not going to have pus coming out of your belly button, but it'll drain through the orifice and drain back in. could cause peritonitis. Okay, yep, can still strangulate. Yep, internal hernias, inguinal hernias, femoral hernias, obturator hernias. Uh, those are typically Richter hernias. So that's a good question, isn't it? I can make easily make a question out of that. Uh, which one of the following is not likely to form a Richter hernia? So you'd have to know the ones that are at risk for forming a Richter hernia. Got it? Let's dig a little deeper into these hernia risk factors before we dig into, let's do some risk factors, just in general. Uh, so any type of abdominal wall weakness will increase the risk because your abdominal wall is important for stopping hernias. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so what could cause abdominal weakness? Well, and just humans in general, I mean, humans haven't been walking on two legs for super long time, so therefore the anterior abdominal wall is weak. It's not super well developed, especially below the belly button. Uh, so it is ripe uh, for hernias because it's just not a strong part in the human. Um, there's also congenital kind of weakness, uh, something called the persistent processus vaginalis, which we'll talk about a little later. I'll probably break this lecture down into two parts. Um, that can definitely be present. 
anything that increases the intra-abdominal pressure can also be problematic. Uh, so like COPD, you're coughing in the morning like crazy all the time. Um, that increases the risk for hernia. Um, obesity increases your intra-abdominal pressure. Now, interestingly, obesity does not increase the risk for inguinal hernias. Um, and we'll talk about that when the time comes. And I always ask that question. So there's another note card. You want to point on the test, make a note card about obesity um, because it's a risk factor for all hernias except inguinal hernias. All right, chronic constipation. Yeah, you're pushing and straining all the time. The heavy lifting jobs or hobbies like weightlifting, uh, lift, uh, construction worker, uh, patients with uh, BPH, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, who have to push really hard to urinate, that increases the risk. Bulimia, people throwing up on purpose all the time, or alcoholics throwing up, that increases pressure. Uh, pregnancy increases pressure. Age is a risk factor. And we've talked about this before. As you get older, you dry out and uh, ligaments get weak. And yeah, so especially the lower abdominal wall and the deep inguinal ring and Hesselbeck's triangle all can get, get weaker and weaker as you age. All right, let's look at groin hernias now. So this is still a category of abdominal wall hernia. Of course, this is in this kind of uh, weird mannequin here. This is the groin, kind of the crack between the, the proximal thigh and the distal part of the trunk. Um, and what is a groin hernia? According to Standring and Shackelford, Standring, of course, is the big, thick Gray's Anatomy book, the, the big uh, black one that's down in the anatomy lab. Um, it's the area, the groin is the area between the ASIS and the pubic tubercle. And, um, yeah, it's kind of a general term uh, with regard to hernias. Uh, but it is under the category of abdominal wall hernia. There are two major types of groin hernias. There's inguinal hernias, which is by far the most common, and there's femoral hernias. So two types of groin hernias, inguinal hernias and femoral hernias. We can subdivide the inguinal hernias into indirect and direct hernias. We're going to go into the weeds on both of those. The femoral hernias are the least common. So let's go into the inguinal hernias. It's the most common type of abdominal wall hernia. It's just the most common type of hernia, period. Um, again, there, there's two types of these things, indirect and direct. The Netter, another board book. Uh, or actually, no, Netter's not a board book anymore. Um, it's not a board book, but Netter calls these congenital hernias, and that's a good, a good analogy. Because it's a, it's, these form from a persistent process as vaginalis is the problem with these. And then we have direct inguinal hernias. All, and that are called those acquired hernias. Note card, easy note card. you got to know this stuff. Uh, in general, inguinal hernias occurs when small bowel herniates through a tissue defect in the groin, basically. Uh, specifically through a area called Hesselbach's triangle, which is down in the groin region, or it actually herniates through the spermatic cord. And, yeah, that would be outside of Hesselbach's triangle. Pers it goes down a persistent process as vaginalis, which, again, we'll get to when the time comes. Here's an important piece of anatomy. So if you're Ant-Man standing on the uterus, let's say, you're standing on the bladder and you're looking posterior to anterior, Belly button would be, oh, I don't know, right about here. But it's on the outside. We can't see it. You're looking in to out. Here's the rectus abdominis muscle. Linea semilunaris would be right here, this black line. And that's the rectus abdominis, the lateral part of the right rectus abdominis. And that forms one border of Hasselbach's triangle. Here's the inguinal ligament coming. Now that forms the bottom border of Hasselbach's triangle. And then we have these epigastric vessels, the inferior epigastric artery and veins. They form the kind of superior lateral border of Hesselbach's triangle. Um, and there's the deep inguinal ring is outside of Hesselbach's triangle. 
Um, and these are where direct inguinal hernias occur right here. Indirect occur, they go down this tube. They go down a persistent process as vaginalis. That's an important piece of landmark right there. I could ask a question on that. What's the epididymia? Epididymia? Epididy uh, can I not talk today? Epidemiology of these things. Uh, they are, again, inguinal hernias are the most common groin and abdominal hernia. 70% of all abdominal wall hernias occur in the inguinal region. That's a big number. Lifetime risk, look at this number. The lifetime risk for one of these hernias is 27%. Remember, they don't always be, they're not always symptomatic, though. 3% in women. So men tend to, they, they believe men tend to have more physical occupations. That's why it's so uh, such a great number. Uh, prevalence for inguinal hernia in men over 75 is almost 50%. It's 45%. So just goes to show you the older you get, you dry out, you get weak, and you kind of fall apart. Right, there's a direct inguinal hernia right there in this little newborn. They can get them too. Epidemiology continued. About 30% of patients with inguinal hernias are completely asymptomatic. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, inguinal hernia repair is the most common surgery performed in the United States. 20 million were performed in 2018. 15% uh, of patients suffer a reoccurrence of their hernia even after surgical repair. What? 15%. So they have surgery to fix the hernia. 15% of them, it reoccurs. Uh, so we don't have a great surgical technique for that. So here's a little guy, probably a, uh, someone who came out a little bit early. And you can see they have bilateral. You can see this all swollen up. There's all intestines down in here. And you can also see they have an umbilical hernia on top of that. I should have put a gross picture. Of work. This is actually, I think, in the Guinness Book of World Records. This is the largest inguinal hernia in a human, uh, New, the New England Journal of Medicine, not the England Journal of Medicine, um, published this, and it was about a case. Um, he, he was seen years earlier, much, much smaller, the size maybe a grapefruit, and they said, this has to come out, and he decided not to have the surgery, and he was seen uh, more recently, and it was the size of a basketball, and, and they needed to do surgery, and he refused again, and now they've come back, and it's bigger than a watermelon, and now they can't do the surgery. The, all his intestines are down in there. It's just too dangerous, and he's too old. Obesity is really weird with regard to inguinal hernias again. Uh, surprising, obesity is protective against inguinal hernias, and it's even though it increases intra-abdominal pressure, and it's a risk for the other hernias we talked about, uh, they, it's thought that the fat shields the lower abdomen, and it might even plug the deep uh, inguinal ring, so intestines can't really herniate down. Uh, there's double fried donuts, always a favorite. Um, some associations, uh, so are the risk factors this could be? Connective tissue diseases, so if you have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, you have a five-fold risk for getting an inguinal hernia. Marfan syndrome, threefold risk. Luis Dietz, I'm not sure about that. Uh, patients with inguinal hernia has been shown to have an increased risk for aortic aneurysms. Uh, well, we know that the connective tissue diseases increase the risk for aortic aneurysms, so they probably have a undiagnosed connective tissue disease. What's the clinical presentation of these? Uh, well, there'll be a visible and a palpable mass in the groin region. We can, we've seen some pictures already. It may come or go with, with bearing down. In fact, a child may notice it when he's constipated and pushing down. and He sees a big bump come out by his penis. He runs out to him and says, Mommy, there's a big bump came out. And then Mommy looks and it's gone because it came back in. But if, if you do a Valsalvas, it may recreate. So it can be a little difficult to diagnose. Uh, in and guys, it can extend all the way into the scrotum if it's an indirect inguinal hernia. A direct can't go all the way to the scrotum. It can still go down, but it can't go all the way. 
Uh, and girls, where does it go? Or do girls even have these? Yeah, they do. Um, uh, it can go down to the labia majora. And we'll look at we'll look at that in a little while. All right. Yep. So here's just the hernias again. Guess we don't need to talk about that. I could have probably taken that slide out. What about the differential diagnosis? Uh, well, if you get intestine or fluid down into the testes, you always worry about testicular cancer. So that's got to be palpated by the doc. So I'd probably send them to their family doc or for a urologist I'd refer them to, uh, to further check that out. Uh, cryptorchism. So that's an undescended testicle. Cryptorchidism. I always say that wrong. Cryptorchidism. Um, that kind of gives the fake look that you have a mass in your testicle because you're missing one testicle. Therefore, the, the scrotum looks kind of lopsided. Um, and inguinal lymphadenopathy. So you may have a lymph node that's swollen way up so big from some type of cancer in that region. And you think it's a hernia, and it's not. It's a lymph node. Hydroceles, very difficult to tell apart. And we'll, we'll talk about hydroceles uh, in the next in the next video. All right, let's continue on and talk about indirect inguinal hernias. Remember, now to really understand indirect inguinal hernias, we have to do a little embryology and anatomy. Uh, so let's go. Uh, through the story of how the testicles descend uh, in the male. So, glubernaculum is the first structure that you should know if you don't know it already. Um, it's a little condensation of mesenchymal tissue uh, that occurs underneath the testicles. Remember, the testicles in the fetus, uh, in the unborn, are way up and the posterior abdominal way, uh, wall way up uh, by, T by T10. And so they need to descend, right? They need to go all the way into the scrotum. So how does that work? Well, they move, they course through the anterior abdominal, uh, anterior abdomen. In front of the peritoneal cavity, that's a very important point. These are not intraperitoneal structures, okay? And they end up um, on the inferior pelvis, uh, where they will be pulled down into an inguinal canal and into the future scrotum. So let's look at a picture here. Uh, so here's the testes. Um, the diagram's not perfect one, uh, because w the peritoneum should be like this, we'll just say, because that's the parietal layer of the per uh, peritoneum. Um, they, they're pulled down really behind it, and they stay outside of it. So they're pulled down uh, by this glubernaculum thing that which, which kind of contracts and reels it in. It's almost like Spider-Man. First the glubernaculum shoots down here and grows and grows and grows. We won't get into how they think that happens. And it attaches down here, inferior pelvic floor region, uh, which is going to eventually become uh, a scrotum. Right. So the testes will move right here as the glubernaculum shortens. The peritoneal cavity will also uh, go down as well. we got a better picture for that, uh, as we'll see here in a second. Um, and yeah, so that's what happens. Next we have something called the processus vaginalis. Uh, and that's that little indentation of the peritoneal cavity I just drew. So the parietal peritoneum uh, is also attached to the anterior inferior abdominal pelvic floor. We can just call it the pelvic cavity floor. Um, and it, it's a it's a diverticulum. It bulges out. Okay, so that's the next important thing. So here's that same picture. Um, and now we can see the testes are anchored down here in the bottom of the pelvic cavity. But now we have this, this indentation of the peritoneum. And in fact, as it pushes down, it takes all the layers of the anterior abdominal wall down with it, uh, including the the origin of the glubernaculum, which is right here. So that's sunk down as well. And as this goes down and down and down, and ultimately will go down like this, 
right? I'm carefully drawing this so it's not inside the peritoneal cavity. Uh, the glubernaculum shortens and pulls the testes right down with it. So eventually the testes, one on each side, will be sitting here, still outside of the uh, peritoneal cavity. This is the peritoneal cavity and it has greatly increased as this thing goes down. And this thing's called the vaginal process, aka processus vaginalis. Got it? All right. And yep, as it pushes it down, it takes almost all the layers of the abdominal wall with it. The only one that doesn't go with it, that's a great question. Because, you know, stick a pin through the abdomen, what are the layers you pass through? Uh, there's one that doesn't go with it. Transversus abdominis does not go down uh, and, form, um, and form anything. It doesn't form the glubernaculum. It doesn't form the inguinal canal. Um, it's, it doesn't do anything. It just hangs out uh, in position, which is kind of unique, right? Okay, yeah, and as the process is vaginalis pushes down, it forms the inguinal canal, right? And the spermatic cord as well. All right. And yeah, pretty soon the process is vaginalis will be all the way down to where the scrotum is. So the descent of the testicles, it really uh, is done by about week 32 of fetal development. So the baby's pretty big while all this is going on. Um, increased intra-abdominal pressure from the growth of the intestines are growing as well. That helps the pushing force. Um, again, a really important thing to remember is the testes are not pulled through the processus vaginalis. Right? They stay behind it, so they're extra peritoneal structures. Although we're going to see something weird happen here in a minute. And, um, yep, they're still retroperitoneal. All right, so here's the, another progression of this diagram. And again, you can see uh, peritoneal cavity is here, and you can see the cavity. It's pushed all the way down, and there, that's it. That's the pro that whole thing's the processus vaginalis. The testes are down here in the scrotum, so is the processus vaginalis. Um, but again, it's outside. This is technically this space here. This is te technically the peritoneal cavity. It's got a little bit of peritoneal fluid in, uh, and everything. But we can't have that, right? We're going to seal that off and kind of recreate the, uh, the peritoneal cavity is the next step. And that's the next step. Goodbye to the process vaginalis. Once the testes are in place, the proximal part of the process vaginalis, really all of the process vaginalis, disappears except the very distal part disintegrates usually into a fibrous cord. Uh, but almost like a patent, pro-patent foramen ovale, in about 25%, right, that's almost the same number, about 25%, it never completely degener degenerates away. And therefore, in about 25% of men, and females for that matter, they have a, um, they have a process as vaginal. It's a little different setup for them. They don't have testes, of course, but there's a round ligament that gets pulled down there. Uh, but, yeah, so in 20, about 25% of men, um, there is a communication between their testicles, and the testes in the scrotum, and the peritoneal cavity, and they can get a little fluid down, a little bit of uh, fluid going down in there. Okay, then the next thing is really weird that happens. Uh, so, let's go back to this picture so I can draw. Um, so what happens next, this disintegrates into a thick cord, so there's no more opening here. This thing elongates and it actually grows out and engulfs the testicle. Not the entire testicle, but most of the testicle. They always show this picture of it, but it really isn't correct because most of the testicle is surrounded by the, the remnants of the processus vaginalis. Um, and that's going to get some new names here, as we'll see in a second. Okay. Oh, I guess I could have just shown the picture here. So there's the old processus vaginalis. It's degenerated away. There's still the processus vaginalis, but it's, again, they have to draw it like this so you can't, uh, so you can see, but normally it would almost completely uh, cover the testes. Not completely around, but... Um, yeah, so this gets a new name. 
Uh, this is basically the tunica vaginalis. And there's a parietal layer is the outside layer. Uh, and there's a visceral layer on the inside. And importantly, this old process, this vaginalis cavity, is gets a new name. It's called the cavity for the tunica vaginalis, or the tunica vaginalis cavity. See how that works? But normally, in 75% of guys, the, the blue is peritoneal fluid. There's no fluid that can get into here. It's kind of its, its, its own little environment here. But in 25%, there is a communication, and that can become a problem. All right, so yeah, so we do have an isolated little peritoneal cavity away from the main peritoneal cavity. And um, yeah, that's kind of the story of everything I said already. Hello, tunica vaginalis. Yep, so the distal trap tunica vaginalis now becomes the basically the tunica vaginalis. And again, the parietal layers on the outside, the visceral layers on the inside, and we have a nice cavity for the tunica vaginalis, which can be uh, a source of problems, as we'll see. All right, and there it is, just another picture. There's the out parietal layer, cavity, visceral layer of the tunica vaginalis. And this is a normal one. It's dried up. It's no, There's not a communication with the cavity in that one. Inguinal canal and spermatic cord. Now, I took a bunch of slides out there. I mean, this is not anatomy class, so I don't want to... We didn't talk about that in embryology, so I wanted to go over that, but you should know a lot about the inguinal canal already. Um, but it was created, again, embryologically speaking, by the descent of the processes vaginalis, glubernaculum, and testes. They all push down through that inf anterior inferior part of the pelvic cavity. And therefore, the inguinal canal has all the same layers uh, that the spermatic cord and testes do. They're all surrounded by the same tissue. And the spermatic cord layers are the external spermatic fascia, which was the external oblique aponeurosa. Cremasteric fascia and muscle was the internal oblique uh, aponeurosa and muscle. Uh, and then the internal spermatic fascia is the transversalis fascia. The transversus abdominis muscle, again, was left out. It didn't, for whatever reason, the committee just left it in place. It didn't, uh, didn't go down to make the... Uh, the inguinal canal. And then uh, preperitoneal fat layer is next. And then uh, the parietal peritoneum is another one that's left behind. That doesn't go down. Uh, we said it used to go down as the tunica vaginalis, but it, and most people degenerated away. So here's a little schematic. It's not perfect, uh, but you can see here's the anterior inferior pelvic wall here from inside out. Um, so this is the peritoneum. This is the parietal peritoneum here in green. And if we look over here, the, de the testicles descend through this and they pull all this tissue with them, almost all the tissue. And we can see uh, where, uh, what stuff is. Transversus abdominis or trans, uh, transversalis fascia turns into the internal spermatic fascia, as I said. Uh, transversus abdominis muscle doesn't do anything goes into a dead end. Okay, so that's this red tissue, and you can see it doesn't, it's not pulled down. The blue, the green and blue are pulled all the way down. Uh, there's a preperitoneal fat that's also pulled down that this author didn't draw that would be in here as well. Uh, and then we have the internal uh, oblique. They don't, th this author's calling them abdominal oblique. We don't call it that. Just the internal oblique muscle. That turns into cre cremasteric fashion or muscle, depending on here, everybody's a little different with that regard. And then the external abdominal oblique muscles turn into external spermatic fascia um, here. All right, uh, scarper's fascia all goes down as well. The skin goes down as well. But that's more in, is in the scrotum. All right, so now with that anatomy background, we can easily understand this persistent processus vaginalis. It's also called a patent processus vaginalis, or a patent vaginal process. And it occurs, as we said, in about 25% of humans when the processus vaginalis fuses, uh, refuses to degenerate and it remains open uh, 
and that is a problem because now the peritoneal cavity is all the way down to the bottom as we've talked about before and here's another picture of it just as a review and we shouldn't have it this should be all sealed up by now this is a I don't know maybe a, maybe a six month old um, and that's no good right because now we have a communication with the abdominal cavity and the peritoneal cavity and yeah peritoneal fluid and even intestines can make their way down actually we have a pathway to go all the way down into the scrotum yep via that that open process is vaginalis in females the intestine can move down they can have one of these two uh, the ovary floping tube and the uterus can get sucked down there as well uh, but they don't have a scrotum of course uh, and there, the end of the road leads to the labia majora, so that's where uh, intestinal hernias and such can go. Epidemiology we've talked about, about 24 to 26 percent, depending on what author you read. 25 percent is probably a, a good one, easy one to remember. Um, and yeah, they have a, a persistent process of vaginalis. Of that 26 percent, only about 20 percent will become become symptomatic and have testicular pain secondary to too much peritoneal fluid or too much just uh, tunica vaginalis fluid building up and pinching the testicles or an indirect hernia where intestines go down and pinch the testicles so out of the people who have this about 20 percent of them actually are symptomatic more fun facts epidemiology uh, if it's present on one side, there's an 85% chance it'll be on the other side. If, and when I say when it, if they, if there's a, a patent processes vaginalis on one side, about 85% will have one on the other side. Uh, only about 11% will get a bilateral inguinal hernia, though. That's kind of, uh, it happens, but it's, it's fairly unusual. Um, hernia or hydrocele. So if the patent processes vaginalis is tiny, most meaning most of it degenerated, but there's still some communication with the testes, then you can't get intestine. The hole is too small to get intestines down through. But you can get peritoneal fluid to start to build in there. If you get peritoneal fluid in a persistent or patent processes vaginalis, your testicles start to swell. That's called a hydrocele. Hydrocele. And there's another, there are two mechanisms. There's a congenital and an acquired, and we'll talk about that next time. Um, if the patent processes vaginalis is wide open and didn't degenerate at all, um, that's big enough where intestines can actually go through uh, that, uh, go through the spermatic cord and write down this persistent processes vaginalis, and that's called an indirect hernia. Indirect hernia. So indirect hernias are the most common type of groin hernia, seen in about 75%, or they, they take up about 75% of the groin hernia pie, way more common in men. Uh, and again, the, the small bowel moves through the deep inguinal ring and down a persistent processus vaginalis, uh, and which is inside the spermatic cord. So this herniation occurs inside the spermatic cord. Um, and yeah, so these are con considered congenital hernias, technically, because you're born with this. You're born with that f processus vaginalis. I mean, remember, we're, we're talking about indirect. We're not talking about direct hernias. Anatomically speaking, the herniation sac will be inside of the inguinal canal uh, and inside of the spermatic cord itself. Uh, the hernia could go, it could stop at the superficial inguinal ring, um, or it could go all the way down into the scrotum. Uh, what are the layers of a small bowel hernia? Uh, what are the layers of an indirect hernia? That should say on 83. Uh, so visceral peritoneum, parietal peritoneum. Oh no, I'm sorry, we're back to, the, this is kind of out of place, isn't it? A uh, small bowel hernia, uh, what are the layers of the hernia sac. Uh, so visceral, no, that's correct. Yeah, this is for an indirect hernia. Uh, visceral peritoneum will be down because if the processus vaginalis hasn't degenerated away and it's still open, I mean, that is the innermost layer uh, 
of a process as vaginalis is parietal peritoneum. So that's true. And then, well, visceral will be on the outside of the intestine. That covers the intestine. Parietal will be sucked down in there because of the persistent process as vaginalis. And then all the other layers of the spermatic cord will also be part of the hernia sac, except for transverse, uh, transversalis fascia. It's the only one that doesn't go. See, here's the transversalis, uh, transverse, transversus abdominis muscle, or its fascia. Um, it stops. See, it's not carried down there with it. And we can see this hernia. They didn't draw the intestines, but the arrow would be the intestines. Everything's there. Uh, the parietal peritoneum, preperitoneal fat, a.k.a. extra peritoneal fascia, that can be quite a fatty layer. You can see that's all the way down here as well. And yeah, all the layers except transverse abdominis. And that should be transversus abdominis. Right, let's look at, there's an indirect hernia. Can't be a direct hernia. Direct hernias can't go all the way into the scrotum. They're stuck up here. All right, so that's an indirect. It's all the way down into the, into the scrotum. That's intestine down there. And here you can just see, this isn't the most technically correct diagram, but it gives you an idea of how the intestines can go right through uh, the inguinal canal and inside the spermatic cord. What about females? Yep, as we said, processes vaginalis. Uh, can fail to close and peritoneal fluid and even intestines can go down the um, down the canal but it all it ends at the labia majora uh, so it doesn't go all the way down so this is the vulva uh, vulvula right vulvula right here or vulva right here and you can see a big bump and that's intestine Okay, like males, if they have a small process of vaginalis, then they could get just a fluid accumulation uh, down that persistent process of vaginalis. Um, and females, they tend to call that persistent process of vaginalis the canal of nook. Canal of nook sometimes. That's a side of standring. Um, but yeah, it stops processes at the labia majora. The large pro uh, processes vaginalis, that may go all the way down, or that may allow intestine to get down, even the uterus, fallopian tube, and an ovary. We said that already. Complete versus incomplete. Uh, so just some kind of fun facts about inguinal hernia. If the hernia sac, uh, whether it can, what, which contains intestine, if it goes all the way down to the scrotum, that's called a complete congenital inguinal hernia, and this is from Gray's Anatomy Standring, the big one, which is a board book. Uh, if it doesn't go all the way and it's still stuck within the spermatic cord, um, then it's called an incomplete congenital indirect inguinal hernia, or just an incomplete hernia. So make sure, that's. I'm pretty sure that is a test question, so make sure you know that one. All right, so this one, is that going all the way to the scrotum? No, there's the scrotum down there. Um, and there's a bulge up here. So um, that's either an incomplete indirect inguinal hernia or it could be a direct inguinal hernia. So it's kind of hard to tell. It's definitely not a complete indirect inguinal hernia. Uh, what about strangulation? We've talked about this already uh, because that's a pretty small tube. If intestine gets sucked down there, there's a huge chance it could strangle the intestine. Will not only cause mechanical small bowel obstruction, but it can literally strangle the intestine. Uh, and we know that strangulation is emergency, but because it, it cuts off the blood supply to the intestinal wall and it becomes ischemic and dies, and uh, then inf inflammation occurs and it can penetrate. You can get a perforation, and peritonitis, and the whole nine yards from that. Uh, it is one of the most common causes of intestinal obstruction of all ages. Testicular ischemia, um, yeah, indirect inguinal hernias that contain intestinal material, it's too tight of a squeeze. And it squeezes the testicular arteries and veins, the pampiniform plexus, and your, your testicle can become ischemic. Not only the intestine, uh, but the testicle. So you got ischemia of the intestine that's down in the tube,
But now you can get ischemia of the testicle, kind of a double whammy. Uh, male is a risk. We're not sure why that is, but 80% of all of these inguinal hernias are in male, or at least the bad ones that require surgical repair. It's possible because they have heavier occupations, lifting more. Um, but there is one big difference. The inguinal canal was created by a test, the testes being pulled down uh, through it. And that leaves a bit, uh, that stretches out the tissue quite a bit. Whereas in a female, um, the ovaries are not pulled through the inguinal canal at all. We said only the round ligament is pulled through, and that's a skinny little thing, so it doesn't stretch out the inguinal canal very big. So that's another theory. All right, that's enough for you guys. See you all later.